We're going to go ahead and continue now with the second session here, which is um, Dr. Edmondson and uh, Marissa Perez, who, who is our candidate. Um, we're going to go ahead and start off with the same questions here. So this is a faculty-generated question here. So I'm going to go ahead and read it again, so bear with me. In an effort to reduce costs for summer school and provide more classes for students, CCFF has proposed to do away with pro rata pay, a longstanding tradition at Cerritos, for full-time faculty in return for a 7% increase to their base pay. What is your position on this matter, Dr. Emerson? Thank you. Well, firstly, I'm happy that the faculty has recognized that uh, problem that we have in that uh, the summer school has two, two elements that are a problem. One, that it costs more than other cl classes to offer, and it's of a small size. So when we're cutting, as we must, a certain percentage of what we do, it becomes a happy target and easy to do. It's unfortunate. We could cut uh, fall and spring classes and have summer classes. That would be a, a balanced way of doing it. But the fact that it costs more from the way it has been done, a ha happy anachronism of uh, this pro rata pay, makes it too costly, makes it too attractive to cut the summer. If we can balance, reduce the cost of summer, and it's a negotiated item, uh, the uh, faculty are working toward uh, making an offer that's a, a fair one to start the proposal. They recognize that the summer is too costly to offer, so we have not offered it. Uh, if the solution can be that somebody can figure out the cost to be uh, fair across the board, summer would be offered. It's just that it's cost too much and is too easy a target. Uh, in the bu dire budget, do you want me to go on to part two? Well, we're just going to do this first, All right. first question here. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's a happy anachronism. It's the size that makes uh, sac uh, the summer school an attractive uh, target. The fact that it costs too much uh, to offer. And so those problems solved, summer would probably be offered. Thank you. Um, Ms. Perez? Thank you, everybody. My name is Marisa Perez, and I'm a candidate for Cerritos College, trustee area number four. I would like to first thank the Faculty Federation and the students of Cerritos College for hosting today's forum. I would also like to thank each of you for taking your time to be here today. I am a Lakewood resident, and my children attend public schools in Bellflower School District. I understand the value of a quality public education. Cerritos College students need to be adequately prepared to either advance to a four-year college or attain the skills necessary to compete in today's global job market. That's why I'm running for Cerritos College Board. I know that we can achieve this goal if we pay our full-time and part-time faculty members fairly and treat them with respect. I am here today because I had loving parents, inspiring teachers, and supportive counselors. There is no way that I could have attained a master's degree without their support. I would do my best to support the faculty members and counselors and staff at Cerritos College when I'm elected to the Board of Trustees. I am a budget analyst by training and by education. I understand public education finance, and I'm willing to spend hours dissecting and understanding the college's budget. The financial situation for community college is dismal. And I hope that Prop 30 passes if we want to be able to just to maintain our current services and classes. I am prepared to ask tough questions. You can count on me to listen to your ideas and explore the ones that make sense and take actions when it's necessary to ensure that student success is paramount to this college. I'm very interested in learning more about this proposal. I also appreciate that this is coming from the faculty themselves. I would like to understand the cost of this proposal and how it will impact the college's salary and benefits expenditures. I want to preserve summer school for students and I will explore all alternatives to ensure that this occurs. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Perez. We're gonna go ahead and go on to the next question here, which is a two-part question. I'm gonna go ahead and read it in its entirety and then we'll go ahead and proceed. Mrs. Perez, you'll be responding first. Okay. In these economic times, there is a public call for shared sacrifice. How would you implement this? Part B, how will you boost the morale of part-time faculty who teach a significant portion of our students, whose pay scales are the lowest in the state, whose office hours are uncompensated, and who receive neither benefits nor job security? Go ahead. Thank you again. 
Shared sacrifice means that everyone on the campus is responsible for a share of the savings and the cuts. If there is no pay increase for one group of employees, then there shouldn't be a pay increase for anyone on campus. If there are cuts in benefits, then everyone should have their benefits cut as well. As a former City of Los Angeles employee, I was first subject to voluntary furlough days. By the time I left the city four years later, I was taking 26 furlough days a year. However, I hope we don't get to this point here at Cerritos College. In regards to the implementation of shared sacrifice, I will lead by example and take a comparable cut to the trustee stipend and any benefits that may be offered to show solidarity with their administrators, faculty, staff, and students. I don't know what the board stipend is here, but I do know that I plan to invest it back into the communities that Cerritos College serves. I plan to donate my stipend back to the college's foundation, the K-12 schools in my district, and chambers of commerces and businesses that will support internships for our students here at Cerritos College. In regards to part-time faculty, I will do my best to boost the morale. I know that part-time faculty members have taken a brunt of the cost savings here at Cerritos College. The state budget is bad, and I don't see it improving overnight. Longer term, I am interested in addressing our part-time faculty members' concerns. We are considering a $350 million Cerritos College school bond in November. I hope that we can address the shortage of offices and meeting space for our part-time faculty members as part of this bond. I know that community colleges in California offer HMO plan only for part-time faculty members. It doesn't include their dependents, but it's a start. Maybe this is something we can do for our part-time faculty members who, who do not have health care otherwise. Again, these are all issues that I plan to deliberate and take action when elected to the Board of Trustees. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Emerson? Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Armandus, uh, and Solomon for, and others for having structured this uh, presentation. These dire budget cuts are a problem. Uh, but they're not new. Uh, in the last 35 years, there's been a 37% statewide reduction in support for community colleges. 37%. From $202 per resident of the state to $128 per resident of the state. We've gone from 80 uh, persons per thousand in attendance at community college 15 years ago to just below 60 per thousand. We're losing the population. The way we offer our courses uh, is historic, but it is not transitional toward the future. And so I have been advocating for 20 years here at the college that we evolve into delivering our services in some other fashion. I support what we do. The board operates as a policy governance process. We don't get into the detail of how things are done. Uh, we try to give direction to administration and the supportive faculty staff decision-making system. Uh, the decisions of faculty in uh, negotiating and pay, the negotiating with the staff is done collegially. Uh, it's all a matter of balance. We have a certain amount of money. The state gives us some. We have to distribute it fairly to all to accomplish the end. Uh, it's not that we don't love people uh, because we don't pay them well we, or give them office hours. It's a matter of there isn't enough to go around to do those tasks. Uh, it's a policy governance issue, and uh, we'll do what we can to make it balance, but it's a matter of balance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edmondson. We're transitioning now to the questions generated by students. Um, Dr. Edmondson, you're going to go first on this. So let me just go ahead and read the question here. As yeah. students, we are concerned about increasing unit costs, rising book prices, and fewer classes offered by the college. What is your plan to address these issues? Well, the first is to recognize what it is. Increasing unit cost, uh, it's thought that it is uh, money that is raised to give back to the college, and it, it isn't. The state gives us an absolute amount. The state takes as a, as a tax what you guys call tuition. Uh, they raise the money. The money goes to the state coffer. They only give us what they give us. They can raise it or lower it. The old traditional idea of a tuition was that it was a part of 
what supported the college, and it really isn't the way the state of California does it. It's one of those mysterious things that the legislature has done to us. So unit cost is unit cost. It's increasing. It's part of what you bear. You think the cost of education is high. Try not having one. It's a great investment on your part. It's a great investment on the state. We once did an analysis here for every dollar invested in your education, the cost to the state is reduced 20% return for the next, for the remainder of your lives. It's a great investment in education for the state. Imagine what it is for you. The uh, fewer class offerings, that's the balance that the state gives us money to support. If we could do it cheaper, we would. We'd give more classes, but the cost of classes particularly the way we do them, is what it is. Uh, I'm sorry that we can't offer more classes. The other part of the problem is that once you've had the classes here and try to go to the university, uh, they have the same problem. So you'll have continually up the chain uh, the problem of ed uh, availability. Study hard, they take the ones with the best grades. Um, the other part of the problem that fascinates me the most is the cost of books. Uh, I've been for 50 years advocating that there be virtual textbooks. And uh, 20 years here at the college, speaking of it, it's now coming. I'm wanting to live long enough to see it occur um, and participate in it. Uh, if you guys have some ideas about how to work this, there's great fortune to be made, social fortune, not physical fortune. Uh, look at TED.com, look at Khan Academy and other sources. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emerson. Ms. Perez? Ms. Thank you for that question. And 20 years ago, I started college. I was able to pay for college through a combination of scholarships, grants, working during summers, working full time during college, and help from my parents. I was very lucky. Community college fees have increased more than 150% in the last 10 years. Students are faced with fewer classes, higher enrollment fees, and less financial aid. Many have to choose between working to support their families or attending college. This is unacceptable. If Southern California is going to thrive, we need to invest more in public education. We need to increase student transfer rates to four-year universities and provide expanded opportunities for students to acquire the necessary skills to either compete or re-enter today's global workforce. To help achieve this goal, I would like to work with faculty, staff, students, businesses, and community members to establish a Cerritos Promise program. This will be modeled after the successful Long Beach City College Long Beach Promise. This scholarship program provides graduating high school seniors in Long Beach the opportunity to attend LBCC their first semester tuition free. And the best part about it, taxpayer dollars were not used for it. Their foundation fundraised six and a half million dollars to fund an endowment for this program, from smaller individual corporation donations to large corporate donations. We could offer this to our seniors in the ABC, Bellflower, Downey, and Norwalk La Mirada school districts. I know it probably won't help all the college students who are here already, but may it help your younger brother or sister or a family member. We can do this at Cerritos College too if we all work together. In regards to textbooks, I believe we should increase our use of technology to reduce the textbook costs for our students. The typical college undergrad will pay more than $1,600 for textbooks for two semesters. Our lawmakers in Sacramento sent government, Governor Brown a package of bills that will allow faculty members to choose free online textbooks instead of printed publication, saving college students hundreds of dollars. If you prefer a hard copy, you could even purchase a printed version for around $20, or you could have it downloaded right to your iPad that I see in the front row. These are examples of two new ideas that I think we should consider here at Cerritos College. I welcome active participation from our faculty, counselors, and staff to see how these programs can benefit our students. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Perez. Our last question here generated by students. Uh, Mrs. Perez, you're going to go ahead and begin with this question as well. Uh, many of the students at Cerritos College lack, lack basic skills. They need academic guidance and traditional classroom instruction as opposed to computer-aided instruction. At the same time, in this physical crisis, the increasing number of students are unable to transfer to, four -year university, to a four-year university due to section cuts. 
How do you ensure an open access community college stay true to its mission? Thank you again. Um, in my earlier response, I mentioned the Long Beach promise. In addition to free enrollment fees for the first semester, it also includes guaranteed admission to Cal State Long Beach after students fulfill certain requirements. Right now, this is for non-impacted programs at Long Beach State, but they hope to change this to all programs in the future. We need to be innovative and work with our partners in K through 12, as well as higher education to better prepare our students for success in college and afterwards. Completing assessment, orientation, and counseling for students before enrollment is a good step in the right direction, and I do think we can do more. When students complete the required classes for transfer, we need to provide a local guarantee to students seeking access to our state university system. Not only will this help students achieve their educational goals, but it will also free up classes here for others at Cerritos College. Again, I look forward to working on these ideas when elected to the College Board. Thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate everyone being here today. Thank you. Well, what we have is a, a population that is not taking education from the high schools very well. Their traditional uh, hope to graduate uh, is decreasing from graduate from high school. They don't learn the skills there, then they bring their lack of skills here. It's our job to uh, repair that loss. A third of our work is doing that. There has to be some other way of doing that. Uh, the college is not doing the college work when it's doing the, the uh, basic skills work. Uh, the question asks, as opposed to computer-aided instruction uh, classroom, and there is no opposition there. They're, they're additive one to another. One does not oppose the other. Uh, some students may benefit by uh, using the uh, computer-aided instruction uh, at home, at class labs, and other ways. It, it adds to the class. It doesn't either or. The question is asked in a way that uh, implies that, implies that uh, one is in opposition to the other, and they're both additive. Uh, the cost of well-designed uh, economic, uh, well-designed uh, uh, computer facility facilitation is uh, one-time investment and it lasts for a long time. Look at the Khan Academy as an example. Uh, the economic environment uh, is what it is. It's going to be getting worse for a while. Uh, the problem is that almost all the people out there out of work need retraining. So when we talk of the patterns that we're speaking of that are the young youth patterns, people coming out of high school, coming to us. Half of our population is older population that needs retraining. The advantage, the mission that we used to have was to do that retraining. And when we focus on just the youth path, uh, that's a mistake because the economy is built on what people know to start with and then that additional piece they learn in the community college to go back to work, to change, to evolve. It's important that that be considered. What the four-year university does, it's, it's in its own circumstance. Uh, you do your best to get in there, but uh, our job is to put people to work, to put people over the poverty barrier from being a dependent person to an independent person. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emerson. So, true to the mission. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the time that we have for the questions um, uh, of this session here. We have about five minutes here. We're going to open it up to some questions here from the audience. So if you have a question, go ahead and hold your hand up here. I'm going to try to get you a mic over here. So if you want to go ahead and go over here, please. <clears throat> Hello. Um, I just want to ask, how much money does Cerritos College have? $75 million. About $75 million a year. Okay, so why, why is... Why is there not enough money to go around, like for summer and also for staff? You want to move on to the health? Sure. I'll take a whack. Okay, I'll, after you. 80, uh, a well functioning community college, 85% of its cost goes to staff. Ours is running at 93, 92%. Uh, there isn't money. Uh, the labor cost of delivery and services is what it is. Uh, the largest portion. Um, there is just, 
there is what we offer, and that's what we have. Uh, if we had more money, we'd offer more, certainly. By having been cut back uh, from 91 million, I think it was a few years ago, uh, we've had to cut back, what, a thousand class offerings, thousand classes. Uh, it's just a matter of balance. You have to have what you have and you do what you can with it. Just to answer. Does that answer your question? To follow up to, to answer as well too, we receive, community colleges across the state get a state apportionment. And it's basically a set amount that the state gives to each community colleges. So as a result, as you know, we're in an economic recession, so taxes overall have been a lot slower, not just for the state, but for local governments as well. So as a result, there's been less money that's coming to community colleges. And um, as with pretty much any you know, public institution, the major costs are salaries and benefits. Because again, you have to pay those first before you can do everything else and stuff. Each one of the employee groups here has a contract that's negotiated with their, with their members and with the administrators. And each, if it's three years, two years, however, men, however long their contract up, that's what it includes. It includes what their pay salary is, as well as what their benefits are going to be. Also, their retirement costs, um, their health care costs, so that's all included. So when you have you know, $75 million as a college budget, a and probably, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's usually between 75 and 80 percent goes straight to salaries before they can do anything else. So again, um, Prop 30, which is on the November ballot, that's hoping to address some of this. It's not actually going to create additional revenue for community colleges, but it's going to help us get back to where we used to be. So take a look at that. You know, be informed about it. That's, again, you're, that's your, your right as a citizen here to be a voter and to be educated about important issues that impact you as a college student. Thank you. Another question? Uh, thank you. Raul Samaneo again, Talon Marks. I am tasked with asking the difficult question. Uh, with the recent success of the U.S. Olympic women's team in London this year, a lot of people have attested that to the success of the Title IX program here in the United States. Um, as an alumni of Long Beach State and now currently attending Cal State Fullerton, both schools eliminated a very difficult choice, their men's football program. Um, Earlier it was said that all things are on the table. Would that be a program that you would look at as far as the cost benefits of perhaps that long esteemed program here at Cerritos? Mr. Emerson? Well, I would definitely first take a look at it to understand the, the complete cost. I mean, that's the one thing. Like I said, I'm a budget analyst by training, by education, and there's really no way I can make a decision on anything without understanding the numbers. I want to understand how it's financed, uh, what the operations and maintenance costs are, how much it is to teach the faculty members, the coaches. So again, those are all things that I would like to take a look at and stuff. You know, I'm not necessarily sure if that's the right avenue to go. I don't even know how much the savings would be. But again, you know, I mean, that's the first time I've heard of it and stuff. But you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a parent. I have three kids who are in youth sports right now. You know, I mean, I, I believe in it and stuff. I believe that it 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 boosts morale and it helps, you know, develop a well-rounded person. So I would like to see that in community colleges as well as universities. So thank you for that question. Interesting question. Nicely political. Um, the first classes and building on the campus was football. And uh, so it has a long, long tradition here. We've been champions for a long time. So it's very well defended by the, uh, what, million people that have come through the college over the lifetime that we've been here. Uh, should it be funded uh, in preference to physics or nursing or something else? That's, a, again, a political question that uh, deserves consideration. It hasn't really been consideration, uh, considered, uh, but you're right about Title IX having made uh, fabulous changes in the opportunities for uh, all persons to have opportunity at sports. There are some programs that are high cost and some that are less. The tendency in our business is to look at the high cost programs and cut them because uh, that is easy. Uh, for example, in uh, automotive technology in many of the high schools, they've taken it out because it's a high cost program and there's no defender for it. Uh, the academics are interested in English and math and history and so on. And what's that technology stuff got to offer? They don't fairly share uh, an authority uh, to have a balance. 
Community college recognizes that there's a balance. You are coming back to the community college for skills that you already have earned at other schools, but you need something that we offer. And the part that we're not doing very well uh, is defending those unique skills that you can come back and learn here, that one piece that you need for the next job. And that's what we have been good at when we say we're defending our mission. I don't think we are very well when we're not defending those particular little pieces. But, you know, in the balance of everything, the budget dust takes all of those little things away and we're left with no music programs, no art programs, and other things in schools. We have to, as citizens, reconsider what is a balanced uh, approach, what is necessary to make people human, what we need to drive our economy one step forward, what you need to do to get from poverty to productivity. And that's what uh, the college has tr strove to do in its mission. And uh, I'm afraid we're drifting away from that a little bit because of the eco economics. And that's too bad. We have one more question. Time for one more question. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say thank you to you guys for being here. But I have a quick question. Um, we have really good professors here on campus. And we have a handful of ones that are OK. And then we have some that are not as good, but then somehow become tenured faculty over the course of their tenure here on this campus. Um, do you think it is right for those that um, the evaluations are significant enough for them to become tenured faculty? And should newly tenured faculty be um, required or mandatory to um, attend the, the Center for Teaching Excellence that we have here on campus? My first, first. Or? Oh, well, Can you, just, just that last part, what was it? You tenure faculty, should they, about the Center for uh, Teacher Excellence? The new program mm -hmm. for teaching excellence that's just opened this summer. It's a little new to, to require, and it's a little new to require contracted people to uh, further their education after they have their contract um, and their expectations of work. Uh, it hasn't been our tradition necessarily to require that people keep advancing in their skill sets as teachers. Uh, they take the task, they get the task, they, keep, they do the task. Uh, I have advocated for years that we uh, offer rather than require uh, continuing uh, increase in skills training, uh, collaboration amongst the, the faculty for best practices, sharing of uh, the best practices in the state, encouraging people to grow into the tests, evolve into the, what the future needs. But with the state in its wisdom, they cut m many of the programs that did that a few years ago, uh, an easy cut, teachers don't need further training, take it out of the line item of the state budget. We have leaders in the Sacramento that are unaware of how the world works, I'm afraid. The actual way it works. And so when you vote for them and send them up there to represent you, you better judge whether they have the sense to run a ship that will not sink. Ours is sinking at the moment. So you're, you're challenged to put people in task who have a sense of what's going on and how to keep it going. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, yes. Um, I also totally understand you. Um, I had great professors, not so great professors, and some I would never recommend to any of my fellow friends and stuff. But you know what? All teachers are different, and I, you know, I applaud them for, first of all, for entering public service. I mean, it's a career that is uh, without a lot of praise and with not a lot of pay and benefits. So that's the first thing. In regards to evaluations, that's something that's negotiated between the faculty federation and the administration. So. Um, I think that needs to continue to remain in there. I mean, if there's any discussion of that, that needs to remain amongst the faculty and the administrators because that's really what they do as part of their, their um, contract negotiations. Um, just in regards to advancing them, I, I, I know, again, I don't know a lot of the details about the Center for Teaching Excellence, but it sounds interesting. I definitely will follow up and look into it. But I do think um, 
continued professional development for faculty members is a good idea. Like I said, my kids attend Bellflower School District. They get off every Wednesday at 135. So from 135 until the rest of the day, their teachers are doing professional development. They're figuring out how they're going to make their students meet the new core standards that California has implemented. So again, paid professional development is good. It's good for you as a student, and it's good for us as a community as well. So again, thank you. I'll look into that. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have for this morning. So can you please stand here?